Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Chef Michelle Bernstein. Good morning, everybody. Why wow, y'all are so serious. It's, <laughs> it's so nice to be here. I am um, a bit overwhelmed. Um, I'm used to talking to a camera guy that's basically looking at his cell phone while he's um, watching me, not so much. The camera's watching me uh, talk to groups of people or talking with food in front of me. So I, I actually, when I, I accepted to do this, I asked them, could I put food in front of me possibly? Because it would be so much more comfortable um, for me to touch food as I speak. Uh, that's always been my comfort zone. You know, being of a Latina, but also a Judea, a Jew, um, as you can see. Um, I don't know, you know, it's funny. I always tell people that the Jewish he is here and the Latina is here, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> You know, good, bad, or ugly, we do everything in a kitchen, right? We sit in the kitchen, we talk over maybe what wonderful things might have happened to you if you get in trouble in school. I sit my son down at the kitchen table and give him a little, you know, maybe a batido de banana, a, a milkshake, and, and let him tell me what happened every single day last week, actually. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing, and what I love about working in the kitchen, but more importantly, working with food is that food brings people together, right? And food is kind of a peace breaker. And every wonderful thing that has happened to me in my life, other than um, the incredible adoption of my son, uh, has been around food. Um, the adoption of my son was in this horrible hospital where they had no food. It was Memorial um, Weekend, so everything was closed. I was hoping to toast with my husband and eat something great when he was born, but that didn't happen. So um, a little bit about me today, and then we're going to go back into me a lot earlier, because I thought it would be interesting to take you through my life through corporations, because we are here talking about you know, leadership. I thought it would be interesting to tell you the good, bad, and ugly, which <laughs> there's quite a bit of ugly that happened to me um, along the way, and my story. Uh, but me right now, um, we own, you know, two years ago I owned four restaurants and it just wasn't, it wasn't where I wanted to be in life. I was, um, you know, we all have things that happen to us that make us kind of step back and if we don't, we should, right? Good or bad, this was a bad thing. I ate a bad piece of sushi, my intestines exploded, I nearly died, I had surgery two years ago. I should be thinner, I know, but I've been eating a lot. Anyway, so when I got to walk again and I was coming around again, I sat down with my, well, I could only sit. I was with my husband um, and I said, you know, I've decided that I need a life change. And he said, oh my God, you don't want to cook anymore? I said, honey, come on, it's the only thing I know how to do well. That's not going to change. But what are we doing? Like, why are we doing this? Why are we running around? Literally, I would go from a restaurant early to another restaurant midday to another restaurant early in the evening and then possibly finish my night out at, a, at the fourth restaurant. But in between, I would cook for my son. I'd make sure that you know, he was good and loved and happy, as happy as a wild child can be. And I would make sure that I was taking care of you know, filling the cars up with gas, cleaning the house, doing all that stuff. But why? Do you make a lot of money in restaurants? To be honest with you, no. Not unless they're these huge corporations that have a ton of money behind them, which my husband and I have always decided to go on our own. So I said, you know, are we good? Are we happy? Are we doing what we need to be? And the truth was no, we weren't. And we were lucky enough to take that step back, take a look, and change it all. So today I'm happy to report that my husband owns a bar called Sweet Liberty with a couple of friends. And Sweet Liberty, we were just in London four days ago to accept World's Best 50 Bars Award. <laughs> By the way, you have to get the cauliflower nachos. I did that part. <laughs> and um, in about two or three months, we'll be opening um, a bar called La Trova. La Trova will be a 1940s Cuban bar on Calle Ocho. 
and uh, wait till you see the croquetta menu. Esta fuacata, it's good. <laughs> I'm not even Cuban. Anyway, <laughs> I put on a good Cuban because I've been here my whole life. Um, wait till I tell you my Argentine accent. But anyway, so um, we decided to do this because we have incredible people that help manage our places. We go during the day, we train people. I cook, I teach the chefs how to cook, how to do my croquetas or whatever else we're making. And I have a little bit of a life. I might travel a lot. Yes, I'm a Lexus chef, I'm a Macy's chef. I'm uh, the Centurion chef for American Express. Um, oh my god, am I already boring you? Stop yawning. I'm very sensitive. Yes, you. You're very cute, but don't yawn. Um, <laughs> I have Check Please, which is the cha Channel 2 show. Um, I have Soflo Taste, which we just got an Emmy when we went to Cuba uh, last year, which was amazing. And I just started filming a national show uh, called Movable Feast, which is a lovely PBS show. There's this gorgeous host, but he likes to surf. So when he goes on vacation, I take over. Um, I know I'm not as statuesque as he is, but it works out pretty well. So. Um, that's what I'm doing today. And yes, it's filling. Yes, I'm busy. And yes, I feed my son every night at home when I'm in town, which is pretty much all the time. And uh, I'm happy to say that I'm a mother first, uh, a wife second, and then a business person third. <laughs> so to give you the tiniest peek into what I've done throughout my career, and this is only about 20%, and we suck at PowerPoint, so I'm really sorry. This is literally the first time we do a PowerPoint, and so it's, it's gonna be shitty, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but it'll give you just a little view as to what I've done in the past. So if you guys mind rolling that mierdita of a video. <laughs> This is South Florida. It's where I live and work. I'm Chef Michelle Bernstein. South Florida is more than sun, sand, and sea. It's a lifestyle of fashion, sound, culture, and of course, food. Food with taste from all over the world. Join me as we celebrate the food of South Florida and the people who love it. I'm Michelle Bernstein, chef and restaurateur in Miami, Florida. I come from a Jewish Argentine background, which is Basically everything, whether it's good or bad, revolves around a dinner table. Growing up in South Florida, I've consumed so many different types of, of flavors from so many wonderful cultures that we have. And all these years has really changed the way that I cook and the way I look at food. This year I am working with Sargento Cheese, doing a lot of demonstrations with them, showing off their new um, artisan, uh, authentic Mexican blend of cheese. So. Pretty cool. I'm doing lots of great stuff and having fun. Sargento Artisan Blend, a authentic Mexican cheese. Que es un queso estilo mexicano auténtica con gente artisan. Hey, it's Michelle Bernstein, your personal salad stylist, here to take your lettuce from drab to fab in just a few short minutes. Remember, BYOL, bring your own lettuce, and my personal favorite is arugula. Choose your Lean Cuisine salad editions. Mmm, Asian style chicken. First, let your dressing thaw. Next, steam your grilled chicken and veggies for two and a half minutes. Mmm. Finally, dress it up, add some crunchy toppings. Voila, your gorgeous new salad. New Lean Cuisine salad additions in the frozen aisle. For uh, Memorial Cancer Institute, first of all, I just want you to know that I'm humbled. Uh, to be part of it. I'm so excited. This has been something that has been my passion for a long time. My mother has had cancer twice and I've seen her through a lot of chemo and I've seen her through um, a really hard time to be eating and to be cooking. Um, so through her I've learned um, that cooking for people that are going through chemo is a very delicate process. Hi, I'm Chef Michelle Bernstein, a member of Macy's Culinary Council. To me, summer means barbecues, swimming pools, drinks on ice, and not taking life too seriously. Please join me at the City Taste of Tennis, March 19th at the W Miami. I can't wait to see y'all there. For frequent travelers departing from Miami International Airport, the new Centurion Lounge by American Express is like a dream come true. It boasts a tranquil oasis in the midst of all the airport's hustle and bustle 
with great food from famous Miami chef Michelle Bernstein, chair massages, and organic manicures. cruise just to be able to do this cooking class with Michelle and to enjoy my wife's birthday. It's one of those things that I'm never going to forget. As you can see, I've worked with a lot of companies, a lot of corporations, and I'd have to, I had to kind of weave my way through. So I wanted to start out this conversation, I know I've been talking for a little while, but I wanted to start this really out. It was interesting. So I have um, an amazing son, he's seven years old. I know I'm a little old to have a seven-year-old, but it is what it is. And um, he can't sit still in class, right? He's like. At, by the time he was three years old, he could figure out how to wire a speaker, but when it comes to school, he just has a hard time paying attention, basically, because he knows he knows better. But um, I went to see someone to find out what I can do to make him, to make the teachers maybe teach him better, because I truly feel that it's up to the educator to know what kind of children they have in front of them. So when I went to see this psychologist the other day, he was explaining something to me, and I, I wanted to throw it out there because it talks a lot to who I am as well and uh, to how I've kind of worked my way through corporations. So there are two types of people, again, according to him and quite a few other people as I started to read further. The villager and the hunter warrior. <laughs> so um, I truly believe that you kind of have to decide who you're going to be before going into corporate America. So the villagers make up most of the population. They're like the Fortune um, 500 CEOs, right? They require a level of structure. They're kind of passive at times. Uh, and they resist distraction. That was a big one for me, <clears throat> resisting distraction and risk avoidance. Um, whereas the hunter warrior is active, uh, they're very sensitive to distractions, like my son who, you know, if I was like searing a steak next to him and he's supposed to be doing his homework, forget about it. He's running over to salt the steak for me. And they're risk takers. 70% uh, of new businesses are started by hunters. And it makes up truly the creativity in our culture. And so I'm a hunter and I need to have the ability to use my brain to create. Um, I'm a little bit all over the place. I'm like shit all over the road. But that's how I am, and that's how I've kind of just accepted myself to be. And you have to decide who you want to be to be able to get yourself through corporations. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about my first job. My first job was at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, a Chinese group, right? I couldn't believe they wanted somebody like me because I was a little fly off the handle. I'd always worked in these little freestanding restaurants. Speaking of which, by the way, I'm going to interrupt myself. Um, there are microphones up here, and usually people wait till the end to be asked questions, but I love when people talk to me during these things because it makes me feel like you guys are actually interested. <laughs> I know that you are. You're listening. You're amazing. But um, I love the back and forth. So if you're interested, there's microphones um, right up here. So if you want to, you're not interrupting. I, I really like it. Anyway, I'll keep going. Um, so Mandarin Oriental, Chinese company, um, they had a culture, right? Uh, a culture that I was not familiar with, a culture that when you're walking through the hallways, and I'm always running, because that's just not in these shoes, but in clogs, you know, the cooking shoes. I'm always running, and I'm, tr I'm always late. I'm always trying to get to wherever I need to go, which is usually five places at once. And I always usually am running with a whole like, piece of fish in my hand or something. And at the Mandarin, we had to smile and bow and take on you know, whatever it is you might be feeling. Oh, hello. I like you, which is bullshit, right? I mean, come on. It's, <laughs> You can't just like everybody, and you know, going into an environment like that, 
you know, the, the huntress like I was, I had a really hard time. And, and I was there for a while. I was there for almost five years. And I loved it. And they gave me the most beautiful kitchen with the most gorgeous ingredients. Hi, beautiful. Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, Don't worry. We can all hear you. Hi. Okay. Hi. So uh, at the, um, when you were working with Chinese, uh, uh, the Mandarin. The Mandarin. Yeah. Good question. Have a seat and I'll let you know. All right. So um, when I first, my first week at Mandarin Oriental, it's actually a great question, <clears throat> they asked me to come up with, and they just decided this because the guy that created the clothing and the design of the restaurant decided that I had to do Chinese food. Take a look at me. <laughs> Would you want to eat my Chinese food? I mean, yes, I'm Jewish. I eat a lot of Chinese on the weekends, which we, all Jewish people do. But you're not going to want to eat like this grandiose fine dining Chinese food for me. I wouldn't want to go to a Chinese restaurant by Michelle Bernstein. I mean, that just makes no sense. So by the first week when I tested all these old, crazy Chinese recipes that I found in these books and I made into mine and I gave the tasting to the executive committee, they said, you know, do what you like. It's OK. <laughs> Do the food that we hired you for. Anyway, going back to the culture. And I'm, so, I'm kind of all over the place, and that's how I talk. If you guys, if I'm going in too many directions, just slow me down, because this is how I am. I get excited. So anyway, this whole you know, not, you know, bowing and smiling and how's your day and all that, that kind of went out the window for me. You know, if I liked you, that's great. And if you're rude to me, then I'm just not going to stop and say hello to you, because I'm not fake. I don't know how to act. I don't know if you've ever seen me on TV. I don't act. If I don't like a restaurant we talk about on Check, Please, I'm just not going to talk because I know what's going to come out of my mouth. It's not going to be good, especially when they talked about that Tark's restaurant. Oh, my God, it was so dirty. Anyway, so another thing that got me into a little bit of hot water was that, and this is, oh, my God, what year is this? This is 2000. This is the year 2000, right? So... Not a lot of people were on the web, right? There wasn't like the talk of the internet. There, I mean, email was maybe started a couple years before, but it was nothing that, I mean, I had an email address. I couldn't even tell you what it was. But when I worked at the Mandarin, they expected me to answer every email and be at every meeting that they sent through emails. So how is this chef who is in the kitchen, tasting, cooking, breaking down fish, Cleaning the floor. I mean, I do it all, right? I, I, I do it all. And I'm teaching, and I'm making sure that's the best restaurant that could have ever come out of South Florida, which, by the way, it was. It was Five Star, Five Diamond. But I wasn't answering my emails, and I didn't show up to meetings. And so I got into quite a bit of trouble. And the executive committee, you know, the GMs and everybody would come into the restaurant. Uh, Michelle, would, you didn't make it to the meeting today. And I said, well, if you would have called me or come to tell me, because you know I'm in the kitchen. You know this isn't going to happen. So obviously, I had to conform. And conform is a big, a big part of what I wanted to talk to you all today about, because you got to conform. Even if you're this crazy, incredible artist, once in a while, if you want to join corporations in America or out of America, and if you want to succeed, you're going to have to conform, which is something I didn't do which is why I left. But anyway, it was hard. You know, I couldn't express my feelings. Kitchen environments back then were not structured for corporate America. Everything I had worked on before, like I said, was freestanding. It was tough. Um, they wanted me to play by their roles, and I had my own set. And um, I guess I wasn't mature enough to realize that we could share a set of rules and probably live harmoniously together. But it just it didn't work for me. Um, and I'm going to tell you a lot about a lot of things that didn't work for me um, because hopefully they can work for you later on if you can possibly control your emotions, but I couldn't. Um, the other thing that happened to me there was that the restaurant I was working in, it was called Azul. I was the executive chef of Azul. Azul had more reservations than the hotel did. And Azul had more publicity than the hotel did. So what do you think happened there? Not good, right? Not good at all. Huh? More work? No, no, I don't mind the more work. That doesn't scare me. What happened was the hotel was really upset with me constantly because they told the publicist, who I'm actually best friends with today, Alex, 
I hope this conversation stays in this room, right? <laughs> they told Alex, stop doing her PR. You need to do more PR for the spa and for the hotel. And you know what Alex said? I've never done any PR for Michelle. She gets it on her own. And she gets it because she's driven, and she gets it because she doesn't stop. So another great lesson. I mean, I don't know how I could have fixed it. What, I could have, I guess, talked quieter, made shitty food. I'm not really sure. But there's definitely a lesson there to be learned. And I truly believe that. So moving on. The same year I started with the Mandarin Oriental, I actually got my first show on the Food Network. I'm sure none of you have ever seen it. It was a long time ago. It was 2000, I believe, in two or one. And uh, oh yeah, it was 9-11, uh, yeah. So it was 2001, and it was called um, Nueva Latina. Actually, it was Nuevo Latino, but I was a Nueva Latina. Um, and so talk about restructuring yourself. So they brought me in, and um, I was to only cook traditional Latin food. Already, we're having a problem, right, because I don't cook really traditional anything other than my mother's arroz con pollo. And I was told, just think of yourself as being in this really cute Latin box. Show a little bit of cleavage. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's nothing you could say back then. Be really sweet. Talk about your grandma and grandpa and how they used to cook at home for you. Well, I never knew my grandfathers, and my grandmother never cooked a thing in her life. <laughs> but it's OK. Talk, you know, tell the story. Tell your story. Well, I don't have that story, and I don't have a cute story. Don't get me wrong. I had the best childhood. I was raised by the most amazing woman, God bless her, in the world who cooked better than anybody. I mean, she stuffed, stuffed Cornish hen into my lunchbox, for God's sakes, <laughs> to go to school. But I didn't have a cute story. And I wasn't so cutesy either myself. I was a chef, and I wanted to be acknowledged by chefs. And I wanted to be just given that stamp of approval that I was a good chef. Not a woman chef, by the way. I never wanted to be a great woman chef. That kind of bothers me. I just wanted to be a great chef. So. What do you think happened at Food Network? I kind of PO'd them as well. So I said, you know, I'm sorry. You haven't hired an actress. You've hired a very honest cook. And I will cook until, you know, everybody's sleeping. I will do my damnedest. My recipes will work on your show. Because let's face it, you give them recipes. Who knows if they're going to work or not. And I will be bright and happy because I am a happy person, but I can't give you that little Latina that you're creating out of your cardboard cutouts. So it didn't work, right? It didn't work at all. And they brought me a lot into that office, and um, I tried to be as nice as I could and respectful, but sadly, what couldn't I do? I couldn't conform. I couldn't be someone I wasn't. So moving on because um, there's really no other story to tell you other than I left. Uh, I was signed to my first spokesperson agreement. And that was great, because years before, I didn't tell you about this restaurant that um, I joined, and they asked me to become a partner, even though I had no money, and my poor father didn't really have much money. But he didn't tell me. He borrowed from credit cards to give money for me to be a partner at this restaurant, which turned out to be that um, they were actually laundering money. But anyway, that's, that's another story. <laughs> learn your business, for God's sakes. If you learn anything from me, learn business, because that's something I didn't take enough in college. So I signed with Sunbeam slash Oster, you know, the Oesterizer. So my face was planted all, planted all over those boxes. I was doing. Uh, I was going to Venezuela, teaching Venezuelans how to make arepas. That didn't go over too well. Um, <laughs> I was doing every Telemundo show you could ever imagine, talking about the Oster appliances, the new beehive blender. I mean, I did it all, right? And I did it for the first time for money. But also, it felt kind of nice to just be out there, right? To be a woman chef and to be recognized for a little more of a domestic kind of side to me, you know, which was something I wasn't quite ready for, but it was kind of cool to do. Um, but when I lost my Food Network contract, 
Ostra didn't want me either. So they said, you know, if you're not going to be on Food Network, I'm sorry. We need the traction. We need the attention. And not against them. That's cool. I get it. You know, there's a lot of reason why, reasons why we're hired. Luckily, today, things have changed a little bit. But back then, I didn't have that contract, so I was out. But before I was out, I took every possible radio show, TV show. I did everything. I flew myself to New York. I did every Today Show, Good Morning America. I mean, I did everything I could do to keep my face out there to keep this contract. Because I, I started to love it. I mean, I started to love the fact that I could be a chef, I could do what I did, but also do these other things. It was so cool. It was so neat. I kind of got hungry for it, but it didn't work. It just didn't work. So I decided to just go back to the kitchen. It's where I kind of work everything out, good and bad and ugly. I just went to the kitchen and I kept on working. And I kept becoming the chef I always wanted to be, which was just a really great chef. It's all I wanted to do was cook my tushy off and do the best food I could and be honest and make my mother proud, which was a big thing. So moving on, I went into Delta Airlines. I actually used to do, if any of you fly first class, I don't. Um, well, I do if somebody else pays for it. But um, I was doing first class food for Delta all over the world. Like if you flew to India, you would eat the Michelle Bernstein on the menu, you would eat my food. My face was on their menu, my food was in their airplanes. It was pretty wild. And they were open minded, they were cool. They didn't care that I didn't have a show back then. They just wanted someone that would work hard and try to make all the food on the planes better. So I loved it. I could express myself. The only thing that had to be perfect were the recipes. But get this, right? You're in a kitchen in, I don't know, somebody throw me a country. Colombia. Well, that was easy. That's close by. All right, so anyway. You're in a kitchen in Colombia, right? And you have... Recipe by Michelle Bernstein. Who the hell is this Michelle Bernstein? Anyway, so recipe by, by Michelle Bernstein, and I have everything by the gram, right? And you're a chef in Colombia, and you're thinking, I know how to make this. This is arroz con pollo. We'll do my arroz con pollo. I don't have to do this Michelle Bernstein's arroz con pollo, so what would happen? It would be a disaster, right? Because I know how to make food for airplanes. I know how to make food to where I'm adding an ounce of chicken stock into the rice before it gets packaged into the cooler into the airplane so that when the flight attendant heats it and God forbid there's turbulence, it's gonna be in there an extra hour. You're still gonna have a juicy, possibly overcooked, arroz con pollo. So it got harder and harder throughout the years. I was with them for quite a while. I think I was with them for about five or six years, but it got to the point where I didn't want to fly to, I don't know, Morocco to have to, I wanted to go to Morocco, but I didn't want to go to Morocco to have to fix my food and to have a fight with a chef as to why it is they weren't using chilies when I knew Morocco had chilies, but they told me they didn't have any chilies. Oh, Morocco doesn't have chilies? Well, what do you mean Morocco doesn't have chilies? I know that there's some spicy food in Morocco. Oh, no, my dear. No, you need to go back and learn these things. We don't have chilies. So I'd have to call the corporate chef at Delta, a big burly guy, and he'd have to call the chef in Morocco who spoke to the sous chef who I was talking to, and of course, an hour later, they had chilies in Morocco. So this is what I was dealing with year after year, and that's really the only reason why, well, and some other financial reasons why I'm not with Delta anymore, but they're an amazing company to work with, and I, I love them. They were the first kind of eye-opening experience for me where I could be myself and they would just accept it. <sighs> Moving on. I got a call from Macy's um, to join their culinary council. Now, most of you probably don't even know what that is, but back then, as a chef, I would watch sometimes commercials or ads or like a, a top chef would come on and they'd bring on the Macy's culinary council of chefs. And it was like they would always have a woman or a man from um, very important different parts of the country, uh, gastronomically speaking. And I thought, oh my god, I'll never be one of those. I want to be one of those so badly. I don't know why I wanted to be it so badly, but I wanted one of those, just like I wanted a James Beard Award. And I finally got the call. 
you wouldn't believe the money. It was um, <clears throat> the lowest amount of money anybody's ever offered me before. But I was so excited, and I was excited to be, I guess at this point, accepted in my career, because I'm still, I'm still, by the way, I'm still looking for acceptance. I don't know about all of you, but I still want to be pretty, and I still want to be, you know, popular, and I, well, I don't care about that. But I want to be accepted. I want everybody to know that I know what I'm doing. Um, by the way, I told Amanda, who works with me, when we first walked in, that I was so scared that this was going to be like one of those birthday parties where nobody comes. <laughs> <laughs> but you came. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, anyway, so I signed it. And I signed the contract, and I've been signing it ever since. The money is still total crap. And it hasn't gone up, by the way, <clears throat> in the last six or seven years. But I don't care. Some things you do because you wanted it so badly and it meant so much to you, what's the difference? It's three or four appearances a year. It's not going to kill me. And I adore it. And I adore working with them. Moving on to James Beard. Now, that was, that was interesting. So um, another thing I never thought I'd achieve. James Beard Award for us is kind of like the Oscars for the actors, right? Um, it's something I've always dreamt of. Not, if you look up, you know, I should have looked it up. If you look up how many women have ever achieved a James Beard Award, the number is really terribly low, but getting much better today. And um, when, I don't know if you remember seeing the picture, but when Tom Colicchio called me up, it was one of the most amazing moments of my life. I wish my parents would have been there. Um, and when I called her from the bathroom right afterwards, she actually didn't believe me that I had won. But, um, <laughs> but what a stunning achievement. And then later, finding out that James Beard organization is like any corporation. And you have to keep the corporation happy. So you have to do the dinners. You have to be a member. You have to do your due diligence if you ever want to actually receive a James Beard Award, which, by the way, I never knew before. But now moving on, it's interesting to me because now I look at everything different. Everything is an institution. Everything is a corporation. And everything has its needs, right? There is fuel for its fire. And you learn what that fuel is um, through a lot of years. Anyway, so as I was telling you before about the importance of TV, and, and being on television, what has taken over? Youngsters, tell me. Social media, thank you very much. So nowadays, you get hired as a chef for spokesperson stuff only if you have double to triple digits on your social media. We're talking in the thousands. I'm talking like 10 to 200,000 followers. It's the only way you get jobs now. In fact, I did a commercial recently uh, about opioids um, through uh, Cigna. And um, it was a very important commercial. It was a very serious commercial. And they had groupings. They had like you know the housewives, and they had the sports people, and they had the chefs. And the first chef walked in. I got there early, as I always do. And the first chef walked in, and Rocco Despirito, really famous chef, really well-known guy. And I was like, wow, this is going to be good. They got some good people. And then all of a sudden, three other guys walked in. I had no clue who they are. And I'm, I read. You know, I'm, I'm, I kind of read a lot. And I'm in there, and I know what's going on. And, and I'm looking up who these guys are. And they don't even have jobs as chefs. But what do they have? They have huge numbers on social media. It's insane. So keep up the social media. Keep yourselves out there. Keep yourselves, more importantly, educated about it. Because as you know, it's constantly changing. What yesterday's Twitter is today's Instagram. And I was heard that I'm not hip enough because my Twitter numbers are a lot higher than my Instagram numbers. Whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm too old to care at this point. However, if I want to keep sending my son to an expensive private school because he needs a little extra nurturing, I have to keep my numbers up. So to me, it is actually rather important. So one last thing, one last corporation I wanted to tell you guys about before I get into um, what I'm hoping you take home with you today is 
one of my last jobs that I have, and I'm not going to mention who they are because it's not really fair. It's a cheese company, and it's a really well-known cheese company that you find at any supermarket. <laughs> this conversation does stay here, right? Okay. So, this cheese company, bastard, how did you know? Anyway. Um, uh, they wanted me to hide my Jewishness, <laughs> let's just say, in not so many words. They asked me to take on my husband's last name, which is lovely. He has a beautiful last name. In fact, if I was named M Michelle Martinez, I could probably be a newscaster. <laughs> Get it, Michelle Martinez? Anyway. I was to be that very Latin, not so Jewish, push the you have no accent, and if you really hear me speak, I actually have a thick Argentine accent. Hide the accent, hide the curls, keep your hair back nice and straight, because let's face it, this is a Jufro. <laughs> and um, be this kind of middle of the road Latina to sell our cheese. That was a tough one. But what did I do? I conformed. I conformed because I felt like I had to. I probably shouldn't have. I probably didn't have to. But it is also who I am, right? I mean, I am Latin, but I am Jewish. And I know that you can't be, most people think that, well, how can you be both? But you actually can be both. So that's kind of what I wanted to tell you guys. And it's up to you. And I never felt like I was selling out. In fact, I fought for who I am constantly. I fought to keep my personality and keep the way that I am and to always be honest. Because this is who I am. I'm not any different when I'm standing on that floor up here or on television. I mean, that's, that's me. And I'm not going to mask it in any way. I wouldn't mind a little Botox maybe or fresh up, you know, freshen up my face. But other than that, you're going to get me. So. Sell yourself, is what I wanted to say. Adjust to your client's needs if you feel like you should or you have it in you. I'm more feminine when I need to be. I'm more Latin when I need to be. And I'm definitely more Jewish when I need to be. I mean, I can make matzo balls that float. <laughs> Adjust the needs to the corporation because that's what I did. And I don't feel like I've sold out in any way. I play the card when I have to. You have to be hungry. You have to have a sense of urgency. I have pushed myself beyond limits when I needed to and backed off when I could. You have to always be ready because I know there's always going to be a younger, cuter, more talented, definitely more skilled chef right here behind me. But if you're passionate and you're humble and you adjust yourself to pretty much anything, I truly believe that you could have a long and lustrous and happy career and feel good about what you've done. Because I can't even begin to tell you, I mean, I feel like I'm just starting out. I have so much more to do. But I feel pretty damn good about the last 20 years. 20 some years, <laughs> never mind, anyway. So figure out what niche you can fill, right? Know who you are and make sure your personality comes out, but be blessed for who you are. Be blessed for every single strand of DNA in your body that might be a little special and a little different that can get you into a different position, a new job, a different corporation, or a new angle. You gotta find your angle, right? So be as honest and organic as you can be, because if not, you're going to make yourself sick. You're not going to be able to live with yourself. You have to be honest. You have to know who you are. Be proud of who you are. Use the opportunities that you have. Given every, get, use whatever card that you have in your pocket, because we are dealt a lot of cards. I mean, the other day I got a phone call. I was asked by an agent, is there any chance that you're diabetic? Because I have this great commercial. <laughs> and that's something that I've never, I've always suppressed. I'm, I am diabetic if I take asthma medicine, and I'm not if I don't. I'm like right on the edge. And I was like, yes, 
I'm sometimes a diabetic. <laughs> I didn't get the job. <laughs> but hey, I was out there. I was out there. So you have no idea how interesting you all are until you take a good look at yourself. You're so much more beautiful than you think you are. You have so many more interesting qualities than you might think you do. I mean, take a look at my face. Who thought that they would put this face on, on TV? You know? I mean, yeah, I have a great smile. I know that, and I work it. But I'm goofy. I mean, I'm really goofy looking. I didn't take after my mother. I don't know how it happened. I look like my old Jewish father. I'm not, you know, I'm not happy about it, but I work it. And I work what I have. And don't be embarrassed about your weaknesses. You have to use it because what does it do? It relates to people. You have to embrace every bit of it. And I love the fact that I can go on these shows or I can come and speak to all of you or I can cook for a thousand, which I do for Basil. Okay, those people I don't really relate to. But with you all, <laughs> and through television, I can relate to you in some way. We have something in common, don't we? There's gotta be something there. Maybe the way we cook rice. Maybe the way we shape our croquetas. I don't know. But I'm sure we have something in common. And that's something that you have to find when you're looking for common ground in your life, when you're working, and through these corporations. Find the common ground. Be relatable. It's tough, you know. I've, throughout my life, I started out working only in upscale restaurants that were only five star. That's the chefs I were. I mean, I cooked in France. I didn't make a dime, but at least they fed me. And I learned how to cook this crazy upscale food. And that's all I wanted to do for the first 10 years of my career. Was it relatable? Hell no. Could I talk about it on television? Of course not. Do the people in Minneapolis, Minnesota know what the heck I was talking about? Absolutely not. So I had to change. And I had to let what little hair I have down and become this person that could talk to anyone. And I wanted to. Listen, you want to be liked, right? I want to be liked. But I want everybody to like me, and I want everybody to get me. So I have let my heart guard down for all of you today. And I'm here to basically tell you that you can be honest, and you can be yourselves, and you can be whoever the heck you are, because it is a beautiful thing. And people will, will want you because you're honest and because you've put yourself out there just like they did. All right, that's it. <laughs> so are we asking for questions? Yes, no? Um, if, please, come on up. Ask for questions. Please, if you don't ask me questions, I'll think you don't like me. <laughs> Hello and good morning. Hi, First good off, morning. I want to say thank you for taking the time to come here and give your story. It was a wonderful story, and I loved every, sec every second of it. Thank so you. thank you. Can we get another round of applause? <laughs> now, as someone studying dietetics and nutrition here at FIU, food is my passion. It's my life. And I'm always looking for different recipes and different ingredients that yep. I can make that also have a huge health benefit. My question to you is, is when you're creating recipes or when you are trying new foods, uh, do you generally think about the health concerns that come with your ingredients or do you go for more of a what's going to be the most flavorful and impactful meal? So I should have prefaced my whole talk here by telling you that I studied biochemistry and nutrition before I got into cooking. So everything that I've ever looked at looks at the healthfulness of the recipe as well as the tastiness. Now, a lot of people think that those two cannot be combined and they're not a good marriage, but I can tell you that, yes, it is very possible, as long as you're not on one extreme or another, of course, because to me, it can't go too much on one side and it can't go too much on the other. It has to meet happily. So yes, very much so. It's a great question. There are absolutely little tricks. Like when I cook quinoa for my son, instead of macaroni and cheese, I make him quinoa cheese. So yes, it's American cheese, or Velveeta, and I'm proud to say it. No, I don't represent them. <laughs> and I make a bechamel out of low-fat milk, 
and olive oil and flour, because he's not gluten-free, but I make a cheese sauce and I toss it in quinoa instead of with pasta. Does that make sense? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'll take one on that side. Hi. Hi. I loved your lecture, and um, one strand I heard throughout is the chef, woman chef. Yeah. And I know this is Can't an entirely it. different lecture, but I wonder if you would touch on that a little bit, because your audience, I think, is predominantly women, it maybe is. some young women who aspire to become a chef, and it is notoriously tough for women to succeed in your field. Um, and I was thinking of a movie like Mostly Martha, which you know shows that you can only do one thing at a time. Yep. Um, uh, and then I was also thinking of Anthony Bourdain, who was so macho. Uh, so if you could peace. touch on that a little bit. I'd, I'd so yeah, so when I got into the kitchen, um, it was the Anthony Bourdain's. Uh, they were cowboys. And um, if I, literally, if I bent over to tie my shoe, there was a penis behind me. <laughs> no, 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 like literally, they put their pants down and they shoved their penis in my face. Um, I can't tell you what I did to their balls afterwards, but anyway. <laughs> it was a rough and tough and nasty place to be. Luckily, all of a sudden, things changed. There are rules. Chefs know them all too well if they're good managers. And whenever I speak at graduating culinary schools, it is 60% women. Now, for some reason, and I'm not sure if it's society's fault or the individual's fault, not that there's a fault here, we're not getting into the big corporate executive positions. I don't know if we're not being offered them because I hear that we are, or we just don't want to take them. As a woman chef, I can tell you that the hardest thing that ever happened to me was wanting to have a child. Um, being a chef, you have to be there morning, noon, and night, right? So where does motherhood fit in? And not to any of those fathers, possibly single fathers out there, I get that too, it's just as important, but to be a mom, right? It's a really hard thing to do. So I don't know if because it's happening when women are coming to that age where they have to kind of choose being a wife and a mother and a chef, that they've decided not to delve into that profession, or it's just not working out for us. But you look at James Beard, all the women that have won this year, you look at every city and their top chefs at least at least 30 to 40% of them are finally women, and it's getting better. But man, it was, it was not easy. It was quite the struggle, which is probably why I never wanted to call, or anyone to call me a woman chef, because I was just as good as the guy next to me. Actually, I was better than that guy or that guy. I was definitely better, because I had more drive than they did. So it's tough, you know, you have to, um, it's not an attractive job, you know, and you just have to think of, the end result and what's gonna get you there. But man, it was, I don't like to talk about it too much because I'm actually grateful that it all happened to me because I was a soft, sweet, innocent girl when I got into the kitchen. I'm not to say that I'm not now, um, <laughs> but I'm not who I was and it made me smarter, it made me better and it made me strong as nails. Yeah, tough as nails I should say, anyway. Yes. Thank you for your lecture, and uh, it's very, uh, I love what you said at the end, because corporation does strip you away from your honesty and your persona. And my question is, as a vocalist that I am, <laughs> in your new uh, restaurant, which by the way, Little, little Havana is being very gentrified, and we need to uh, stay on focus on that Which one. is why we're doing Cuban. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you going to have, since it's Trova, right? It's, it's live music. It's all about the live thank music. Thank you. Come and on in. We might be able to use you. Thank Absolutely. Are you going to be having a, a booking agent? A, you know, a music booking I'm agent? I'm sure they will. Yeah, I don't deal with it, but of, of course they will. Absolutely. If you okay. give us your card, we'll get into touch, in touch with you because um, La Trova will be all about the music because it comes from Santiago de Cuba which okay. is where my partners and I came together and decided we needed to open that in Miami. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for asking. Great thank question. You. Thank you. Hi. Hi. 
Um, so first, I want to say thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank and you. And uh, I am a young, inspiring chef. And I would love to show you some of my work if I can. <laughs> Did you bring anything for me to eat? Because I haven't had breakfast yet. I have brownies. I eat brownies. Oh, no, I don't. Darn it. I quit sugar yesterday. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I'm also... My son will eat them. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I'm a diabetic, too, so... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Um, anyways, uh, I, wa I just wanted to know... Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. Uh, one being, why did you want to become a chef? I heard like a little bit through your lecture, but I want to know like the full story as why you decided to bec become a chef. Okay. And the second question is, what is your goal now? Mm. Oof, I have a lot of them. So that's too long a story, but why I wanted to become a chef. So I was a prima ballerina, um, and I hated lo the life of it. I was dancing in New York, I was 17 years old, and I, all I did was miss my family. So every time I came back home, I would cook with my mother and eat her food and feel better. And she said, so now what, Mishi? What are you going to do? So I went to college, studied what we were just talking about, the nutrition and the biochem. But it always related back to food, even though subconsciously I had no idea. And after I graduated, I went back home was cooking with my mother, making some cakes because it was Christmas time. And she said, so now what, Mishi? I said, Mama, I have no idea. All I want is to be here with you in this kitchen. This is what feels good. She said, funny you should say that. There's this cooking school that's opening <laughs> just a few blocks away. Why don't you walk in and just, I don't know, check it out. Maybe one day you'll have a TV show and talk about healthy food. And there you have it. So it, I walked into that cooking school, and I had butterflies like I hadn't had since I was dancing ballet. And it felt right. Now, I didn't know I wanted to be a chef. I worked for six years with the same chef, Mark Militello. I was drilled. I was connived. I worked my butt off because I wanted to be the best in that kitchen. But what did I want to be? So every year, the guys would say, so Bernstein, what's it going to be? You know you're not going to be a chef because Nobody that looks like you and acts like you can be a chef. So what do you want to do? Well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm happy right now. A year would go by, it would be the same question. What's up, Bernstein? You're not going to be a chef. You're too much of a little princess. So finally, a few years later, I looked at all of them and I said, I got it. I, got, I know what I want to do. I'm going to kick your asses because I'm going to be a better <laughs> chef and a better cook and a better executive than any of you. And why? Because it's in here. I didn't come here because I had to. I came here because I wanted to. And that was it. That was the beginning. What cooking school was that? Johnson Whale. Doesn't matter what cooking school. If it's within you, you can go anywhere. Absolutely anywhere. <laughs> come on, you're hogging the mic. I'm just kidding. <laughs> One more? Okay. My goals, um, I want to be a better cook and a better mother. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, Ty. Thank you. This woman has incredible farms down south. She's an amazing woman. She fights for us to use farm fresh goods from Florida. Ty's, can we give Ty an, a look up and applause? OK, talk to me. <laughs> um, you address the issue of being a female chef and how hard it is to be in that male-dominated world. What about the navigating the corporate world and how um, you felt the differences were with the? It's funny you should say that, because I loved sticking out with my femininity in the corporate world. I loved and I used the fact that I was Jeff and I would walk in with this red dress on and I knew I was getting that job. Not sexy, smart, different, vivacious, bright. I would walk in and I would say, huh, there's no women at this table. And they're going to eat their dust because there's going to be more women here soon. And, and I loved it. And I, ate it up. And yes, I felt like I needed a sisterhood with me because I knew it was going to make me stronger. But I didn't have it, so I used what I had. 
And I taught them all a lesson. Thank you, honey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Oh. Thank you. Should I walk off? I don't know what I'm doing. Sure, yeah. Okay, if you want, thank you, everybody. Up.